to this uh, happy hour with me <laughs> and everybody else that's here. So uh, there's no no real format today. I'm not really going to give a presentation on anything except uh, put the questions up on the screen as they um, we had people sending questions ahead of time. So we'll go through the ones that are there, and then if you have more questions in the same category, um, feel feel free to ask those on the questioning. And hopefully this time I'll be more responsive to the questions as they come in because we've set up the format here a little bit differently to make sure I see the see the live questions. Um, no real structure on this, but it's kind of evolved a little bit into a jobs mentoring thing, technology, and really anything you want to talk about. We're going to stay away from strictly technical, you know, small stuff you know, intricate into power supplies and just deal with the bigger issues of uh, what everybody's going through. I hope you all have your beer. I've got my trusty mug in my Adventures of Home class, which you might all be able to buy soon. We don't know yet. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's the probably, it's probably the biggest social activity any of us have had for a long time. We've got about 200 and, uh, 250 people signed up here. Coming and coming along, we hope. Um, there's a couple of handouts. You can download the Happy Hour webinar PDF, Happy Hour web webinar eight PDF, and that has the set of questions that I'm going to try to answer here. And then I've been asked to do a little thing for the Women in Engineering. They're having a session, the ECCE conference coming up on mentoring. So I put together a short video on mentoring. They asked me for one minute and I couldn't get it under four. So it really touches the tip of the iceberg of the question of mentoring there. Um, so take a look at that if you like. If you're looking for a job or you're looking to be moving into the workplace, um, hopefully that is helpful to you. Um, I'm monitoring names coming in. I'm monitoring the screens here with questions. So hopefully many of you already submitted your questions. Let's see, East, West Coast is three o'clock, East Coast is six o'clock. Um, so those people are at home, hopefully with their beer or a glass of wine in the hand or whatever they like to drink. Uh, Europe, we try to squeeze this in, so it's 11 o'clock over there. So I'm um, not sure how successful that's gonna be uh, in Europe. People don't like to work after hours in Europe and maybe they think of this as work, I don't know. It's not supposed to be. Anyway, cheers again. Right. <clears throat> And if you have a question, you specifically want to raise a question, you want me to get it right away where we're on the topic, you'll see on your phone or on your computer, you should have a little hand that you can put up to ask a question. And um, then we can get to that one right away while it's fresh to with the topic that we're doing. And no questions so far, so that's cool. Uh, first topic, lots of people asked a little bit about mentoring in their careers. Um, I'm guessing a lot of students ask that, but a lot of people uh, working in industry as well. I think it's a unique time right now where everyone's kind of feeling a little bit alone in their job. If they're still working uh, from home and they're doing hardware, they're doing design and so on, it's, it's kind of tough without anyone around you. And maybe you're not even surrounded by the equipment that you're used to having. So you know, it can really, really make you feel like you're alone in this business. And the first question I got was, uh, can I talk about my mentees and the ways in which you help them in their careers and about your mentors? Well, I didn't even know mentee was a word. Sounds like a Florida sea creature to me, but I think that's manatee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and about my mentors. And it's not something we think about or I haven't thought about too much in this industry until the question came up. But, uh, you know, exactly what is a mentor and do, do we need one? Does anybody need a mentor? So I, I guess one little story I can tell is uh, when I first started work, that was way back in the dark ages in 1981. And I just finished my uh, undergraduate and I did a project in power electronics. It was a uh, as I know now, it's an LLC converter that I built with a AC output of 6,000 volts, 20 kilohertz. And I spent many, many months in the lab 
blowing things up, electrocuting myself occasionally, and trying to make that circuit work. And I had pretty good hardware experience when I finished when I finished school. And of course, I had all the normal things like advanced control theory, optimal control, nonlinear control. Uh, nothing about magnetics because they don't teach that at the undergraduate level where I was at Boston University. So I went to went to work, and uh, they gave me my project on my first day, which was a schematic. And I looked at the schematic and said, like, "Okay." Well, I'm, I'm, I'm here to, do, to design power supplies, so obviously this is a power supply, so I started looking around the schematics and I could see op amps and caps and RS and some coils and lines and things like that. And I spent about uh, three days staring at the schematic and I could not find the power supply in there. You know, I knew a little bit about what a power supply was, you know, some flybacks and things like that, but uh, not much beyond that. So I finally went to who, who I now realized was my mentor, who uh, told me, well, Ray, it's not actually a power supply, it's a power distribution unit. And those little squiggles there, they're not inductors and transformers, they're actually relays for turning things on and off. And that's the project that we've given you. So <laughs> that was a little bit humiliating that, you know, I finished almost top of my class and I couldn't actually read a schematic, uh, let alone read data sheets, of parts, op amps, comparators, and so on, and make any head or tails of what I needed to know from those sheets and what was not important. And that's where it's really important to have someone who, who steers you through that process and helps you. And uh, you know, you're gonna go and do do all the hard work to get, get the thing understood, but somebody's got to guide you. And it's not really something that university can do for you because it's always so specific to the industry that you're you're going into so that was my that was my first experience with uh with mentoring and then we'll talk about mentees a little bit uh later and next question here are there any mentorship programs or experienced individuals interested in providing guidance and uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, there's nothing really formal out there that you can tap into. You know, maybe maybe in your individual company there is, but it, it's kind of a, a, it's becoming rarer these days. People are, people are very worried about their jobs. Uh, workplaces get a lot more stressful and aggressive and, you know, mentorship, people are very careful entering into that kind of relationship. Some companies do it well, the big companies, they spend a lot of time, you know, working on that kind of thing because they know how necessary it is if you want to get results out of your out of your new hires. So we'll talk we'll get to the answer to this in a minute. And uh, someone else asked, well, I'm starting my career in power electronics as a developer in engineering, uh, presumably for a big company, he means there. In a long time, he, he wants to run his own business he needs some advice <laughs> so you know there's all kinds of advice that's needed there uh there's there's the advice on what kind of technical field you should go into there's advice of legal you know how do you deal with legal things how do you deal with accounting how do you deal with contracts and so on and you know that that kind of advice is it, it's hard to get people that have gone out and done it you know again they're so busy with their company then it's not necessarily something that you know the advertiser service to share that with people. So you know the mentoring process really is is it's kind of you you have to get to know somebody first who does this kind of thing, and then they have to get to trust you. So you know when I started my first job where I got that schematic, I had a roommate who he he needed to get to know me first so he gave me uh dr chuck's dissertation put it on my desk i said i want you to read this and tell me how state space averaging works and it's like okay I, I i thought of that as a as a as a technical challenge and an intellectual challenge to uh to to see you know whether whether i had the chops to do this kind of thing later on i realized one, he didn't actually know how to do it himself. 
And two, he was just testing to see how much work I was prepared to put into the relationship together. So if he was going to give me his lifetime of experience in magnetics and power supply design, he wanted to know that it was, I won't say worth it because that sounds selfish. He didn't mean that. It's like when you teach somebody something in a mentoring program, that person, the mentee, is the one that does the work. It's not the one who's the mentor. The mentor is there to add guidance and steering, but he's got a full-time job. And it's the mentee that has to put in the time. So your, your first real test is, well, are they willing to work to be a part of this process? And I did. I spent three full days on uh, Dr. Chuck's dissertation and marveled that somebody could come up with such a an amazing mathematical technique for something completely unknown at the time. And I was pretty good in uh, deriving the state space averaging at the end of three days and taught my mentor as my roommate and he was very happy. And then we started, you know, a two, three year relationship of uh, building a power supply and him teaching me everything that he, he knew about that. But through, throughout that whole process though, I was the one probably putting in 10 times as much work into into things and just coming for help when I needed it. Now I said, is, is there a mentorship program? It's like, well, it wasn't intended as such, but there has become one, which is our Power Supply Design Center Facebook group. And we've got four and a half, five thousand engineers on there now who are all actually eager in helping people. If somebody comes in and asks a beginner question, as long as they ask it in the right way, you know, don't, it, it, you don't come in, you say, hey, look at my schematic, do my work for me, and, you know, then go away. And, you know, that's not mentoring, that's just getting someone to do the work for you. So if you come in and say, look, I've got this kind of problem I'm encountering, I don't know what choices to make on this particular project, can you help me? And then a lot of engineers who are on this group, many of you are on this um, on this webinar right now, will we'll step right in and say, hey, did you try this? Did you try this? And whoops. And that can result in some, you know, test processes, things to do. If you find yourself in that situation, the, the, the response is say, well, thank you. Let me go try that and then go put in uh, many long hours into the lab and then come back and say, hey, I tried what you suggested. And this is what I got. Can you provide the next step? All too often we see on the group, somebody says, well, I don't understand that. Can you just tell me more about that? They, they try to get the mentor to do all the work to solve the problem. And it usually ends not, not well with somebody says, you know, it looks like you're trying to get us to do your homework assignment or do all your job for you. And, you know, this isn't what it's about. So, that doesn't work if you're not asking the right way and you're not responding to the help by going in and you know following the advice you know then then it's not going to work but if you do do follow that then a lot of people have actually come into the group solve their problem they give us the waveforms they give us feedback and it's all part of this mentor mentee thing where the person being mentored ends up teaching the mentor, hey, yeah, I tried that. Look, this happened. We've got this interesting waveform and this worked and that worked and that's great. And then we actually all learn something. It becomes almost a, a group mentoring thing. So if any of you are needing help, I do encourage you to come and come and join this group. I know lots of you are on it. Um, yes, I know, as always, it's, it's Facebook, but it's the best place for doing this kind of thing. There's also an upcoming event as part of the ECCE conference uh, dealing with mentors and advocates. And I, I seem to remember they split it up into coach and advocates and mentors and mentees and training and all these different levels of relationship between someone who's giving and receiving you know, guidance. And they're all different levels. And, and to me, the mentor-mentee relationship is the most intimate one that evolves where there's a lot of trust built up first. And then that is also the one that becomes the most, the most rewarding. So do sign up for this, for ECCE. If you click on this link in the handout, it will take you to the registration page. 
and then there's a bunch of uh, sessions on mentors and advocates. And during you know this time right now, everybody's very uncertain. Um, you know, jobs may be in jeopardy. Lots of people looking around for different things to do and wanting help on you know where to go next with their careers. It's a it's a good time to be looking at these things while you're at home. And then there's other people at home. They they they, they want to help as well. Those that still have the jobs are you know are willing willing to help out there. Again, step in if you have a question or you want to say anything. Just uh, just fire out the question, and we're watching them here. Maybe it's not technical enough today, and uh, in that case, you should just pick up your beer and have another swig. Okay, jobs and careers in power electronics. So <laughs> this is always a uh, an interesting one. I recently completed my master's in power electronics. Although working as an electrical design engineer, should I change jobs or go into power electronics? Um, if you're gonna ask me this today, <clears throat> if you have a job and you're getting a paycheck, I might recommend you stay there for the time being. <laughs> it's uh, very tenuous out there right now. Um, power electronics can be volatile. Power jobs, you know, they're, they're always going to be there, but they can sometimes be the first ones to go. It's like, okay, that project got cancelled, so we don't need the power department, so get rid of that person that was in power. But if you're if you're in a solid design job, just just sit there for six months. You might not like your job. Um, if you have an MSc in power electronics, you don't really know, need to go look for that job in power electronics. It, it will come and look for you. Somebody will find out one day that you've solved a power problem or you've got a master's in power electronics. You know something about volts and amps and controllers and topologies, and they will find you. In fact, you can't, you can't escape. You will end up doing power electronics somewhere, maybe not full time. Some people bounce into this field. They do a power electronics, pass by design, and then they go back into signal processing, digital, whatever they were doing before. But uh, yeah. Changing jobs, probably not the most solid strategic plan right now, but hey, if Tesla is calling you and they want you to go into, you know, the power electronics department, you can probably trust that. So it's just very much company dependent. So don't take advice from me. But that's just some thoughts for you on that one. I'm a power electronics student soon to be graduated. Graduating. What advice will you give to a new graduate to become successful? Uh, work really, really hard and know something really, really well. So as a new graduate, you're going to go into an interview. And you're probably going to be very stressed about the interview. And, you know, it's like me when I was interviewing people, I, I was stressed as well about talking to a new graduate. What am I going to talk about? How am I going to figure out? You know, this new graduate is coming in. He's probably very, very smart at equations and things like that. Um, you know, it, you, you need to create something to be able to talk about in the interview process. So be an expert in something and be confident on that. So, and, and you know, being as well-rounded as possible these days with job markets tight, employers really want to hire people that can do everything. So they're looking for a broad as base as possible. So if you've just done a little bit of simulation and finite element modeling for a certain small sliver, and that was your master's degree or whatever, you know, broaden out a little bit. Make sure you know LT Spice. Try to learn PSIM. Try to learn a little bit about Boardland. Just just learn the language of all aspects of power electronics, and that will that will help you. Do a lot of reading. You can come to our design center and read there. You will find out lots of things. Which companies are good to work for? Does anybody want to give some companies out there? Quite a few people online now. Does anybody, would anybody like to volunteer their company up as somebody good to work for? Or is everybody going to stay silent? And so any recommendations come along, I will pass them along. Just put those in, uh, in your questions, and we will pass that along to people. And how is the salary stacking up against other electronics engineers? John? You should know that. 
John Beecroft is here. Well, just go, and he's always here on the webinars with us. Hey, John. Um, I think the more experienced engineers have good salaries. I think the fact that uh, power electronics is a bit of a niche. Yeah. Um, it's tending to keep wages on average a little bit higher. No. Um, but there's been a lot of competition from the Far East, which right. is now tapering off, which has kept wages down over the last couple of decades. But I, I would say they're uh, better than computer science grads okay. and not as good as chemical engineers. <laughs> but amongst other electronics engineers, they're right up there. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. So that's good. Yeah. Sorry, is good. If you're asking, could you stay in power electronics? Uh, I would say yes. You know, I was a little bit iffy on that. Maybe 10 years ago, it seemed like everything was going away, but uh, I still see the old faces here. You know, every year we go to the conference and everybody's hanging on to their job. And uh, if you want to work to be a power electronics engineer until the person in the room next to me when I started my job, he was 92 and he was still going at power electronics. Uh, you can't do that if you're a, if you're a programmer or a computer science or something like that. So, yeah. Ah, TI, there you go, TI. <laughs> TI has been pretty good to work for. I won't give anybody's name here. Big company disadvantages, but overall better than other places I've seen. So TI, take a look at them. And of course, they're always growing and getting bigger. They're this giant machine now. And uh, interestingly enough, the whole topic of mentor mentoring was led by Denise, you remember the lady's name from TI? Oh, uh, Stephanie. 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 She's running the program for women in engineering, and she's with TI. And we were Stephanie Butler. Stephanie Butler. Um, so you can probably search her. But she was talking about the mentoring program within TI, where she had something like 250 people signed up for the program. So yeah, that really gives me a good good feeling about TI, in terms of you know. And you know, be careful when you listen to people about is a company good or bad. You will always find somebody that says, I hate this company because they had a bad experience. But these, these are big organizations. And the overall feeling I get from TI is, you know, they're, they're, they're solid and they treat their people well and people have nice things to say about it. So uh, yeah, comment there is overall better than other places I've been. But of course, big company is big company. So I work for a little company. You know, we have our own company here that has its own stresses, of course. But compared to what you have to go to with the big companies, all the, you know, training and this and that and a lot of the nonsense you have to deal with, well, if you can if you can handle that, that's that, that's cool. But T I P I, there you go. Who else we got? Uh, analog devices, there you go. They're looking for power electronics engineers. So analog devices, of course. Let's see how they work. We had LT, LT got swallowed up by analog devices, so a big collision of giant power electronics groups there. And they had some amazing, you know, it seemed like you had to have a PhD to be in the uh, analog devices group. Um, no, no, the, that was the LT group. And then the analog devices people came in and they were really good designers as well. And now they've, they have swallowed up, who was it, Maxim? Uh, thinks, uh, Maxim, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Maxim. So analog devices are now swallowed up Maxim. So it's it's the growth of the two the two giants, TI and analog devices now. So you know, I hear good things about them too. Of course, some people are a little upset about things that happened after the mergers, but that's always going to be the case there. There's so a question there at the bottom: What applications in power electronics should young engineers focus on? Okay, let's let's let, let's. There's another question just like that one, so I'm going to say that's from Norberto Sanchez. There, <clears throat> Siemens. There you go. Hear good things about Siemens. They're involved, of course, in uh, high power. So yeah, good things about them. So there you go. So like the big companies are winning out on this one. Um, I would say from the companies I visited, uh, if you can get a job at SpaceX, go there. Go there. It's the most amazing company I've ever seen. I don't know how well they pay. People say they, they get worked a little bit hard there, but oh my goodness, what a, what an amazing uh, creative work they're doing there. I've, I've never seen anything like it anywhere in the world. So if you can get in there, um, Tesla, 
you know, obviously they're doing amazing things with the electric car. Of course, they're shifting now to being a, you know, production car company, but any anything to do with uh, Elon Musk, you know, if you can, you can find a job there, go, go work there. And even if you burn out after a little while, because it's hard, if you've worked for SpaceX, I mean, just name your price, you can go work somewhere else. If you work for Tesla, you know, same thing there. So yeah, I would I highly recommend those those two companies. Uh, let's see here, next one. After the masters, which would be a better option? Taking up a PhD position or joining industry as an R&D engineer? So, Just thinking of my own uh, experience there, I, I have to admit when I when I went back to school after three years working, went back to get a master's, and then I had the option: should I go back to work or should I do a PhD? It's like I was kind of enjoying my master's, so I didn't want to go back to work, which is my original motivation for doing a PhD. So that's a little different from most people. Uh, if you're doing a PhD, it means you're kind of heading down the teaching path. So if you want to be a teacher, if you always want to be an in industry, as always be want to be in the university system, then you know you've got to think about the PhD. But one thing I did, and I know Bob White, who's on here too, uh, if you get some industry experience before finishing your PhD, it's a really good idea. So if you went straight from undergrad to masters, and now you want to do PhD go get some experience first because then when you come back you do a PhD and have a much better chance of doing a PhD that means something otherwise you just get caught up in this you know solve this equation that equation you're not solving a problem that somebody really wants solved in industry so when you go into industry you say well this is what we're actually really fighting here so you get a lot of broad experience of the projects that are very important that then you can then take back to the university and say, hey, look, this is the kind of thing people are looking at up there. So if you can go out to work for a few years as an R&D engineer, you know, by all means do that. So, so no, no definitive answer there, but uh, I, I don't like to think of people going all the way through without ever doing any, you know, industrial experience. If, you, if you're in a program that provides that, so, you know, some of the universities, they, they, they get you very close to industry. But it's always good to go outside for a little while and then bring that experience back in uh, to do to do your to do your PhD afterwards. What are the chances <laughs> of getting a design job after your master's in power electronics with no experience? So I, I know what you're you're getting at there. It's like you know, go for your job interview and you got your master's, and then you look at the description of the jobs that are listed on LinkedIn or wherever. It's like, well, they want this, 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 so everything you got, you know, with a master's degree, and then they want 15 years experience, you know, and, and they're not going to get that. Of course, they're not going to get that. But um, my advice would be, if you're doing your master's, is do something that gives you some experience, like build a circuit, do something hardware related, do something that's real, so that you can... I would say fake experience. You, you you have experience of something real, and not just you know academics and solving equations and calculus and all of that. So yeah, I, I don't know what the the job market is obviously in great flux right now. There are lots of people being changed and moved on, but the, the, there's still a huge amount of design going. But you, you've got to be able to hit the ground running, you know. So so know some layout packages, know some things that will you know make it look like you're ready to actually produce when you get to work I, I don't know how you get around this thing you know I was talking about when I started my job it's like I didn't know how to read a schematic and I don't think any students really know how to read schematics that aren't in their very specific sector I mean nowadays I can just throw my eye over schematic and I can pull the circuit out pull all the bits out immediately without actually even reading the parts you can just see the picture if the schematic's drawn well, which is a different topic entirely. But there you go. Get some experience. Look at make it look like you've got some experience by doing something real while you're in your master's program. <laughs> How rewarding financially 
is a career in power electronics versus other career avenues available to the electrical engineer. A uh, good story there is uh, there was an engineer from uh, MIT. Uh, he did uh, magnetics. He did studying of uh, proximity effect. I can't for the life of me remember his name right now. I remembered it just before this. Um, but he read some really good papers on proximity loss in magnetics and how to wind a magnetic and position the gap and everything else so that there were pro no proximity losses. And then he was finishing up his PhD at uh, MIT and he decided to go be a quant on Wall Street instead. <laughs> so that's a career avenue available to him because he was obviously very good at mathematics and financially that would have been a lot more rewarding than being in power electronics. Okay, but obviously we can't can't all do that. And um, it's good, it's solid. Power electronics is always going to be there. It shifts around from place to place, but people need more power now than they ever have before. It's just a field that's just going in all directions. But uh, hey, you can go into management. You know, you do power electronics, you do a good job, you move up the management chain, and you know, and you can run the company. So it's a good a start as any. I would say. Let's see, Andy Goldberg. There you go. I knew Bob White was going to come up with that one. Andy Goldberg. So he was there. He was probably listening to that paper, and he probably heard the story that Andy had gone to work on Wall Street. So he went to predict what stocks were going to do up or down, you know, and wrote programs to to do that kind of thing. But he read some good papers before he went there. Before he went to the dark side. Research in power electronics. What do I think? Oh, hold on. There's a couple more questions coming in here. Let's see. Are these the ones that are unanswered, right, John? Yeah. So the, there's one about the Master of Engineering versus Master of Science in Power Electronics. Right. Yeah. I don't think it really matters, does it? I mean, do what you enjoy. Master of Engineering versus Master of Power Electronics. Is that the one you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. You, I think you should come out. If, if you're going to do power electronics, get the masters in power electronics. You, you've got to know what a volt and an amp is. And, you know, is 100 amps a lot, 1,000 amps a lot? How hot should things get? You know, you've got to have some common sense about it. So I would say, you know, I'd go for power electronics. And then usually you find that if you know power electronics, you, you also know a little bit of digital, you know some layout, you know some EMI, you know all kinds of things that make the transition into other aspects actually fairly easy. So there's a lot of people that bounce in and out of power electronics and then go help the company in other aspects. So yeah, I would do for that. Long-term job market for power electronics, I'd say it's pretty solid. Um, back in 1980, they were predicting the fairly immediate demise of power electronics. And it just hasn't happened. So back then, and you know, some of you will remember, you know, DEC Digital Equipment had the biggest power electronics group in the in the world, and they just decided one night, just get rid of them, hundreds of them. So what did they do? Well, they all went down to AT&T Bell Labs and they had the biggest power electronics group in the world. Really, good, really good group. A few years later, eh, enough of that power electronics. Moved them on. And the big groups don't survive so much as they used to. They get more fragmented, but the number of jobs is going up all the time. You know, so many people need power. They, they've got to do it in-house and they just can't find anybody to do it. So I'd, I'd say it's pretty pretty solid, the long-term job market. And what was the other one? Colin Tuck says, full stack power electronics engineers, hardware, software, PCB layout, simulation. It's like, well, you're not gonna get that out of a, a fresh student. And quite honestly, as you move on, you can't be everything, you know? I mean, I, I, I do everything that I do, pretty good at magnetics, I do software that we sell, but you know, I'm not an embedded programmer. And you know, about 10 years ago, I had a, you know, a bit of a crisis thinking, well, I've got to become an embedded programmer if I'm gonna teach power electronics. It's like, no, you don't have to. You know, you, you hire embedded programmers or you hire the aspect that you don't personally have, but you better know the language. Otherwise you can't hire the right person. So, 
having the full set of skills you need for electronics, I used to tell people is about 10 years from when you first start work, about 10 years later, you can call yourself a power supply designer and do the whole thing. That's easy. You start with the spec and then 18 months or whatever the time frame is, you deliver a product. And you've been through EMI, you know anything, everything about quality, reliability, thermal, mechanical, but you're not doing it all. You work with the mechanical engineer. You work with the reliability engineer. Nowadays, you, you can't know it all anymore. You can't be that embedded programmer. You can't be everything that they want in the power electronics designer. So having the full stack of talents is probably a 30 year process. By the time you finish, you've probably forgotten the stuff at the beginning. So, you know, it, it's getting harder and harder to do that. PCB layout though, do learn PCB layout. If you don't have that, you've got nothing. If you can't, if you can only draw a schematic and then you have to find a layout engineer to make it happen, you've, you've, you've just got nothing. You know, it's like, it's like, I suppose it's like being able to write recipes in the kitchen and then you don't actually know how to cook. So the PCB layout is just the, the guts of making circuits work. And it, it's a very advanced thing to, to learn. There's very, lots of things you have to know about the you know notations and so on. But you can be a good PCB layout because it's all about you know spacing and EMI and loops and planes and things like that. You have to get into that early on. For me, I learned all that by, you know, taping. We actually used tape and we built the planes at two to one scale and we could see and feel what we were doing. Now, case, of course, it's all on CAD, but the CAD programs are free now. So yeah, absolutely, as a student, make sure you know what PCB layout is about and make some, do some, get the boards back, build them, mess it up, do it again. For me, I, I, it's always the same rule. It hasn't changed since I've been in this. Uh, you're going to lay out a board three times. I don't care how good you are, something's going to go wrong. <laughs> Hopefully you get better at it as you go and there's less and less to do on each iteration, but there's always something that you miss. It might just be the name on the board for the third iteration. You got that wrong. Oh, it's a spelling mistake. Better fix that. Okay, but um, learn PCB layout. Definitely add that to your talent stack there. So I've been having a conversation with Tony Salsich from Miller Electric yeah. about the loading business. Yeah. His last comment, uh, it's a lot more interesting than it may seem, which I acknowledge. The welding business. Oh, yeah, the welding business is, uh, I bounced in and out of that many times. The devil and the joys and the details. So my, my favorite welding <laughs> business story, which uh, I can tell it now because the company is probably not there anymore. Is uh, I was called in to help a welding company that were having failures in their power supply. It's like this 10 kilowatt welder. And I'm sitting in the board meeting with this welding company, and the CEO is there, everybody else, all the engineering team, maybe 20 people around the table. And they're sitting there talking about how their MTBF is 200 hours in their welding power supply. I'm looking around the room to see if anybody's shocked. It's like, no, oh, everybody's, you know, pretty serious and saying, well, you know, uh, yeah, we've got to make sure we keep that 200 hours MTBF. And, and yeah, I finally put my hand up. I said, I said did, I, did I miss something? There? Did, do you mean 200K hours? 200,000 hours? Uh, no, 200 hours. And I said, well, why do you want 200 hours? I said, that's pretty awful. And they said, well, that's better than our competitors do. <laughs> so, so. Well, you know, they were, they were happy there. And, and then they had this other process problem that they were losing 30% of their units during burn-in. And the proposal to solve that, some of you might get ahead of me here, was to uh, reduce burn-in to 20 hours. So they didn't lose so many power supplies before they got shipped out. <laughs> what was the problem? Well, they built a 10 kilowatt welder. It was going in that awful welding environment, all kinds of EMI. And there wasn't a trace of a current sensor anywhere in the converter. So, of course, it was blowing up. Was, you know, an EMI spark would come along and, you know, it would turn on the switches a couple of cycles too long and bang, everything was gone. But uh, I suggested they, they change some things and uh, I didn't get invited back there again. Powercom. Powercom? The, the welding company? No, they were in New Hampshire. 
Okay. Tony Sarsi. Tony Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if I knew the name, I probably shouldn't tell you any because they might still be a business. But what was the point? How did they make money? Well, they sold welding tips, and the welding tips are really expensive. And if you can get your welder to last 200 hours of use, which is about a year actually, you know, they burn through a lot of welding tips, $10,000 of welding tips, and they just ship them a new, a new power supply at the end of it. So I know the industry has moved on a little bit since then. So power con, yeah, happens with welding. Hey, it happens everywhere. Okay, I've seen this story everywhere. Let's see, most converters which push some sizable power are done using embedded. Embedded code, yeah, yeah, of course. But if you can do embedded code, make sure you got an embedded coder. You're not going to be an embedded coder. I'm not talking about code that monitors and buses that control. I'm talking about who's in that innermost loop there. There are topics that they know about that we don't even know exist, and then you just bring in an expert to do that kind of thing. But you have to be aware of it, of course. We're going to, we're going to go digital. Um, it's going to accelerate as the GAN comes in and it makes the turning on or on off of switches just a digital interface now. We're not going to need the controllers with the high power drivers anymore. So, you know, the digital is it's going to be more and more. So you you've got to stay up with that stuff. But uh don't don't stress out that you've got to become a programmer. You you, you don't. You've got to recognize what is needed on that team. All right. Oh, we're getting lots of questions coming in now. You know, knock off the ones I got, John. <laughs> Yeah, I'm knocking them off there and putting some pieces on them. What, what's hard in power electronics these days? It's a lot more interesting than we've seen. Well, okay, we got that. Okay. Research. Where's the research? What are good PhD topics to work on? Uh, uh, so there's so many. The problem is. The problems that the industry would like to see solved are not necessarily the problems that they're going to fund, and they're not necessarily the problems that the university is interested in working on. So there are lots of topics of things, little things. It's like, you know, there's a hole in this analysis here. Somebody needs to take care of that, and it would be a good PhD dissertation. Um, whoever asked that question, just, just send, send me an email or ask on the group, and I can give ideas. But I need to know what your you know, your expertise is first. So, you know, we have so many projects down in our lab that just sit in the drawers because we, we don't have time to deal with them. They'd all be good PhD topics, but they're not going to be PhD topics that attract funding. That's so what attracts funding right now. Well, it's alternate energy, it's the stacked power systems, it's the multi-level converters, all the papers, you know, they're, they're not researching these topics because it's hot research and there's a lot of research going on, it's because the funding is there. So the funding is absolutely pouring in to that. And that's not necessarily the problem that needs to be solved. It's just that people desperately need that kind of power and they will pay for it. So they're trying to get on the cutting edge of it. But, you know, so yeah, there's a contradiction there of what the good PhD topics are and, you know, what's going to bring in the money because that's what makes a good PhD topic. Are there still research topics that may be of huge impact in our industry? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, it means that we've done everything. Sorry, did you have a question? Take a look at the last response. Last response. So I just did a blanket one on embedded code. Well, PhD and multi-phase hysteretic control back. I don't think anyone's going to fund it. No, I really don't, because I think they. Um, I think the control chip companies are doing a lot of this and. They're just not going to have the big chunk of money to to fund that. I mean, there's lots of topics like that that I agree. One before that. Oh, one before that. Sorry. <laughs> Integrating magnetics and power devices and drivers, a la Vicor. Spike. Well, yeah, they're doing some of that at Virginia Tech. They're doing a lot of that, obviously, with Vicor. And then this is another interesting thing: is that from what I see, the real research goes on inside the companies not at the universities and that may sound a bit bizarre but if you think about it so we'll talk about vicor and the integration of magnetics and devices what's their budget well their budget is tens of millions of dollars a year for maybe five ten years so they're putting in 50 to 100 million dollars and then a university 
grant for a project is like, well, 100K used to be big. For 100K, you get a couple of students who are just students, but they don't have the the resources, you know, of making a new die, you know, machining things. They, do, they just don't have that. So a lot of these, you know, areas of research, they're happening in the companies more than the universities, and they use the university for the things that they're good at. It's like, okay, do the finer element analysis of this, but they keep the real research very close to their chest because uh, they don't want anybody talking about it. So, so again, a, you know, a, a, a difficulty in research these days is getting a hold of the really good stuff. And I know at the University of Nottingham, when I visited that one, we've been talking about that lab, a lot in our group recently, they have the most amazing labs there. I mean, they have students, we talked about somebody on our group who was winding a 200,000 volt transformer in the pub. That was, his, that was his job because they didn't have a good winder and, you know, they had to get this work done. But they're building, you know, megawatt power systems in their power electronics lab. Scales the hell out of me, but they get their students involved in this and involved in, you know, really big stuff. But in that group, you see all the impressive things going on that they're doing with ABB and so on. But then upstairs, there's a private room. No one's allowed in there. They can't write about it. People like Airbus are sponsoring them to do it, but they're doing the hardcore research, which, you know, is, is a balance of what you can do and what you can put into a PhD topic and then you know, just balancing that whole thing together. But yeah, there better be some more research topics. Um, we're all pushing towards, you know, 100% efficiency. Saw a couple of papers yesterday on LinkedIn that promised 238% efficiency from a system. That was interesting. Uh, <laughs> they've been going around a long time, but I wouldn't hang my hat on that one. But yeah, there, there should be more, but it's not necessarily going to come from the universities. So. What topics do industry like to adapt from the research of a PhD student? They like to adapt the topics that are gonna make them a lot of money. So they don't want a pile of equations, they want to make money. So if you've built some hardware and you've shown you can solve a particular problem, the industry is gonna look at that with a great deal of interest. Okay, so, you know, we, we can't tell where it's gonna go. But obviously, shrinking down smaller, getting more efficient at the same size is, you know, a general trend of every every part of our industry that we're all looking at. Gosh, lots of questions coming in, John. Yeah. Future job opportunities, master of science or master of engineering? Oh, geez, I don't know. I don't know the difference between. I would say, do, 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 I don't think it would matter, but do what you prefer to do. If you've got the choice. Yeah, I don't even know what I mean when I got electrical engineering degree, it was an MSc, it was a master's of science. Didn't you know, isn't isn't that the same? I don't know. If you're doing science in general, as as John mentioned, if you can do chemical engineering, shift into that instead. They're making all the bucks these days. So that one's interesting. Yes, I'm gonna cover the chip buck too. Don't worry about that. Uh yeah, universities want patents. I mean, this is something that happened when I was at Virginia Tech. It's like at every university, they were all chasing the Gatorade model. That, that's what drove it crazy. So the University of Florida invented Gatorade, and they made millions and millions off the patent for Gatorade. And then everybody looked at that. All the departments say, "Wow, well, let's we got to got to file a lot of patents." I don't know that many university patents that have made a lot of money. Some of you may know some that I don't know, but I I, I don't know about that. So anyway, any others? Do, 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 do. Yeah, in the US, um, you know, the, the, the groups are well funded in the US and they're funded by companies. I mean, it's not funded to the same extent as they're funding their own internal research. I mean, it's two orders of magnitude different. But the money still comes in, and I think the money flow into the U.S. universities is still probably better than I see in Europe. Um, I'm more familiar with the U.K., where and it's changing. It's going more to the U.S. model, where you know the industrial work of the students is becoming to be accepted. 
and I think Germany has always been good at that too. There's a very close link between the university and the uh, and industry. Uh, FPGAs for control, absolutely. Do FPGAs? Just don't come ask me about it. I can't help you. All right, next one. Good stuff for the future. I think we I think we covered that one. Industry direction. Where's it going? Latest trends in power electronics. Well, you all know the topics. FPGA, digital, that's out there. Of course, that's coming in. GAN is big, but not necessarily for the reasons you think it's big. Um, the GAN things that excite me is the gate drive power is so low, they can incorporate the gate driver in it, and you're just sending a signal to it. So I, I can't tell you how happy that makes me. I'm so tired of designing gate drives. I'm so tired of debugging people's power supplies and figuring out what the gate drive is doing. It's kind of crazy. Because in in our in my smaller area of DC to DC converters, you know, you've got to build a good rugged gate drive, but you're not allowed to spend any money. In the high power fields, they spend a lot of money. They have digital isolators, great big floating isolated power supplies, and they do the gate drive right. It's not a problem. So I think that's coming to lower power. Where, you know, if you remember bipolar to MOSFET, it's like, oh, wow, look at that shift and gate drive is so easy now. But it really wasn't. You still had to put 10 amps current into these big devices. Now we're taking that step again with GAN, and GAN didn't solve it at first because gate was difficult. Gate drive was difficult. A whole mess of stuff and a more awful gate drive than we'd ever seen before. Now that's getting integrated and that's happening there. So that's that's a really cool aspect of it. Uh, topologies, same as we've always had, that really hasn't moved a lot. Uh, magnetics is what magnetics, but some great great trends in magnetics with, uh, I wouldn't say train, planers are new, because they're not, they've been around for you know, 40, 50 years. But the combination of planar and matrix transformer and high frequency and integration of magnetics with parts is, is, is huge. So, you know, if you come back in 50 years, we may not have magnetics companies anymore doing, you know, this kind of stuff because it's not it's not going to exist. It's, it's going to be a board and a core and just a mechanical construction. It's not, quote, a magnetic anymore. So that that's happening right now. What about AI? I assume this means intelligent machine learning. It's like, well, we've got to get a bit of not artificial intelligence, we've got to get a bit of, bit of normal intelligence into our industry first. There's still a lot of floundering around in, in how things are designed, and nobody knows the design rules yet to put into AI. So I, I don't see that replacing anybody soon. Um, but I think I, I assume they mean the semiconductor industry, I mean the, the, the power electronics industry. But in um, the higher power levels, where you can afford these sophisticated uh, processes, you know, AI gets used for optimizing controls and so on. So that's 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 all in there. Not not so much my my field. I just kind of watch it interestingly. Are we going to use AI to design the magnetics? Uh, I don't think so. There's just so many practical aspects of that that AI doesn't really come into play that I see. Will planar transformers become normal? Yes, they will. Will they be widely used? Yes. Will they be application specific? Yes. <laughs> All these things. Planers came out, first ones I saw were in the 1980s. But when you build a planer, you know, you've got mostly PC board and a little bit of conductor, and it's got all kinds of reliability issues as well, which might surprise you. But uh, planers are going to be there, and regular magnetics are going to be there as well. All right, so there we go. We've got five minutes to deal with this one. So I'm sure lots of you are hanging on to see what I'm going to say about this. On the DC to DC Chuck Buck 2 topology, is it valid what Professor Chuck is advertising? And this is the DC to DC Chuck Buck 2. Looks like a buck at the front with a little half bridge switch arrangement. Then it's got a resonant tank. And then this auto transformer here, and then that kind of looks like a normal buck sitting there. And of course, there's lots of ads and claims, hyperbole, hyperbole. Every every paper does that, you know. One of the things about being in this is if you were to read every paper, every app note, 
everything has ever been written on power electronics and you truly absorbed it into your head, you would pretty much know nothing because you wouldn't know what to do because everybody says theirs is going to work the best. So you've got to watch out for that. But let's look at this topology because I, I do find it interesting. There are four things you need to participate in the next generation of power, of high power density. It's got to be four conditions. Number one is zero voltage switching. So S1 and S2 in this circuit diagram here, it better be zero voltage switching to make things work. Second condition is the current through the rectifier or the voltage across the rectifier, it better be soft switched. You cannot keep going up in power if you're going to hard switch either of these devices. So that's the rectifier. So that's the second condition. Sorry, two conditions, right? Soft switching on all the devices. You've got to have that. It could be zero voltage here, zero current on this one. Next one is the energy, any energy stored in the inductor had better be as small as possible. So we're only using the leakage energy here as the resonant tank. There is no inductor storage per se. So the storage in an inductor is about a hundred times different to the storage in a capacitor volumetrically. So everybody that's doing a high density converter has knocked out the main inductor. Next condition is, I guess that's two conditions, soft switching here, soft switching here, tiny inductor, small as you can get it, and then a transformer. Got to have a transformer if you want to be serious. So this topology meets the requirements of having a chance of being part of the next generation. Okay, so it's, it's got what it needs in there. Now, the problem is there's lots of topologies that meet that requirement. So the LLC meets that requirement. It's going to have the same front end switches here. That's the same. That's the same. That becomes a normal transformer instead of an auto transformer. And then the rectifier. Of course, in both cases, it's a, it's a synchronous rectifier, not a diode. So the LLC, of course, is in that class as well. That's why the LLC is being showing up in these very high density converters. You can build a normal buck converter. If you build a normal buck converter, let's forget the transform, we can put that in, take it out later. Build a normal buck converter and you make the inductor really, really small, but it's always in discontinuous mode, even with 100 amps output. You can make everything soft switched. So you've done the soft switching on the switches, you've made the inductor really, really small, you put the transformer in there or you take the transformer out if you're not stepping down by too much. So there's a whole class of converter that meet this requirement and the Chukbuck 2 is one of them. Now, the question is, you know, the next question comes along is, you know, should should you should you play with this converter? Absolutely, you should play with it. If you're a student or if you've got students and you don't have somebody looking at this, they should be because it's interesting. It's a really fun converter to play with in terms of learning something. It's really quite similar to the first converter I ever built, which was an LLC converter with a transformer in there. I just didn't have a rectifier on the output. And I learned more from that project than almost anything I've done because I spent so many hours agonizing over The real question is, I think, should this be invested in as a product? And then that's where it gets more difficult. It's like, well, you don't know until you get into the nitty gritty of the topology. So people have gotten into the nitty gritty of the LLC and they've solved it and they've spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have poured into the LLC to put it where it is today, which is a pretty nice converter. Same thing with Vicor converters. They meet all these four requirements for high density power, but the investment is enormous. So it's a very interesting topology. You know, should you invest in it to make it a product? Well, that's entirely up to you as a company. Should you invest it as a student to look at? Sure, if it's fun, but make sure you're building hardware on it because you won't learn anything through a simulation. Lots of people come back to me on the group said, well, I simulated the converter, it looks interesting, I didn't build anything. It's like, well, you know nothing. You know nothing because it's about the second order effects that happen 
when you build any of these topologies. And this one is just kind of interesting. So, you know, Dr. Chuck has a knack of making interesting things. He made state space averaging. Pretty interesting. I, I don't personally use it anymore because there's things that supplanted that from his students. He made the Chuck converter. And the Chuck converter was really interesting. The fact that nobody had thought of it before was showed great creativity and more people have invested more time in the chip converter in the universities because it's interesting it's great for a phd dissertation is it going to be a product for some people yes so this is another one it's actually an interesting converter when i first looked at it it's like well that can't work because there's a blocking cap there we've got to pass dc to the output but it misses the nonlinearity of the past here. so this is a huge learning tool it's a fun learning tool um whether it becomes a product or not, it probably has a chance, but somebody's got to invest a lot of money to take this. Now, the next thing that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the low frequency operation of that because I think that is something interesting happens in these transformers with one volt output is that the secondary of the transformer or auto transformer goes to one turn immediately. And then you're at one turn it's like well you might as well switch at a lower frequency because you can't go less than one turn can you it's like well <laughs> actually you can so the one thing that this is you know missing a little bit here that it would have to bring on board is the matrix transformer so when vicor make their incredibly incredibly dense packages for giving 500 to a thousand amps output they don't use a one turn secondary they use a tenth of a turn or a 20th of a turn, because they've got lots of turns in parallel and lots of primaries in series to effectively get a much lower turns count in there. That's the matrix transform. So that's the next magic ingredient for this. So the chip buck too would have to have to do that thing too. Thing that, things that concern me, and I, I'm not sure if I'm right here, because I, I haven't even simulated this thing. I don't have time or bandwidth to look at these things, but if you're a student, there you go, go play with this. Um, the secondary winding seems to me is, unipolar in terms of current i don't exactly know how the transformer is driven i'm sure dr chuck has talked about that whether it's using all both segments of the transformer probably it is because that's that's one of his big things but hey is is is, is everything valid in the claims well probably not you probably can't do 90 percent efficiency and the high density and the low switching frequency and the low cost and the control but i i don't know but certainly it deserves some thought because he, he always comes up with some kind of interesting uh, topology that we should be looking at. So that, that's my thoughts on the uh, chip by converter. Somebody's saying that it's not what I asked. I don't know if he was asking about this one. Is it valid? Well, Dr. Chuck is after I'm well, well, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. You can make up your own decisions on that, but you can't answer the question until you start building them. No one can answer the question until you've seen this in action. Okay, not just simulations, you gotta see in action. What if I put a plane of transformer in there and I did the matrix transformer? Would it make it viable? Would it get it there? So 99% efficient converters are happening. People are getting there. Okay, is this gonna be one of them? Well, it's in the same class, so it's got a chance. I don't think it's any better than any of the other ones that are in the class, but it may have some advantages that I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not a big fan of auto transformers in general. Just, you know, they are, they're, they're transformers. I mean, maybe there's a benefit to it. I don't know. Again, so you build the hardware, you're not going to know about this. So if I had some grad students to spare and I didn't have to pay them anything, absolutely, I'd set one of them onto this converter so we could all learn something and see what it's doing. Because I think there is a lot to, lot to be learned there. Hopefully that asks, asks your question. Oh, no, that was a different one. What part of power electronics is progressing in development at the slowest pace? That's from Nick Sarti. Well, I'll give you a second. Nick, what's what's your answer to that? Which part of power electronics is progressing at the slowest pace? Well, ah, uh, where do I see that answer? I answered it and said Tesla removed the magnetics. Right. It's like it's like no, mag magnetics is not is not a holdup. I don't know where, well, this come, I'll tell you where this comes from. <clears throat> Originally, it came from the first GAN companies who said that we're going to switch at the speed of light or whatever it is. The only thing holding us back is the magnetics. And it's like, no, it's not. It's the fact that you haven't chosen the right topology to use your fancy switches on. 
So people don't have a problem with magnetics when they choose the right topology. Okay, maybe this is one of the right topologies. Maybe the LLC is the right topology. Maybe the matrix transformer is the right topology, but everything is done in magnetics and there's amazing work going on now. It's not gonna move. So if you're counting on magnetics, getting a core material that's 100 times lower loss and 10 times the BSAT, it's like, well, you may as well retire and do something else because it's not going to happen. We've had 200 years on magnetics. It's already where it needs to be. Now the creativity is going to go into the topologies to work with the magnetics that we have. So we don't need new materials. You can't have new copper, okay? But the creativity of the matrix transformers is not just being researched that was done a long time ago the patents have expired and now they're in the vicor converters take a look at what they're doing take a look at what dan jitaro is doing he talks all about that the way you dress the turns around the pole pieces it's very very clever and it wipes out the proximity losses and lets you go up to these higher frequencies so there's no hold up in magnetics there's just a hold up in the understanding of magnetics and a big part of this was also is like if you want to convert from 48 volts down to one volt and you want to use a buck converter it's like yeah the buck inductor is going to give you a problem so don't expect the magnetic to solve it change the topology because that's a stupid topology for that particular application okay so i, I don't see any hold up in magnetics i mean how fast do you want them to go magnetics moves at what speed john instantaneous yeah. speed of light Magnetic fields move at the speed of light. So GAN will catch up one day with the magnetics is what I can say there. So <laughs> no problem with that. What else we got? Slowest pace. It, it, you know, if, if you're seeing your magnetics moving at the slowest pace is because the magnetics company you're working with is moving at the slowest pace. Take a look at what other people are doing. Take a look at what Vicor is doing. I don't have one of the little widgets here right now. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, never mind my my vicor board is high but some of you did that original uh webinar a while ago where the converter is this long and one centimeter by one centimeter and it puts out 500 amps and the magnetics are inside there so magnetics no problem just apology so there we go there's uh there's the uh chuck bug too so yeah explore it have fun with it but please build it please 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 build it it's hard to build it you know putting these things together and trying to miniaturize this it's all about the packaging how are you going to integrate the magnetics and the semiconductors and the resonant and get all the tuning right and then the second order effects that come in that's going to show up when you when you build the thing okay so it's one more in the class and converters that are moving us to the next generation and let's see growth hot topics we've done that embedded power on good sources learn about emi good sources learn about emi um who is it from eric bogatin i think does emi uh fellow called mark nave did emi um there's lots of emi books out there best way to learn emi the only way to learn EMI is make a power supply, measure the EMI, figure out how to design a filter to fix the EMI. Until you've been through it, you won't know it. So simulating EMI to me is a, a, a bit of a bit of a waste of time because it always misses and you've got to build it eventually anyway. But you've got to learn how to get in the lab, measure the EMI and fix the EMI. And if you want to be just an EMI engineer for the rest of your career, you will always, always, always have a job. So that's a good uh, skill to get under your belt. And uh, I don't like EMI much. I don't like fixing it much because, you know, you're just kind of putting things around and there's not much analysis to it. And there's not too much structure to the process except for measure, design a filter, then change the filter, you know. And then sometimes the noise just sneaks by anyway. It couples into an adjacent, you know, piece of metal slides around the filter and appears on the other side so fixing that kind of thing is a pain so read um read whatever you can by mark mark Rave and um no, it's mark Rave? Yeah, i think it's the right name and uh, eric bogatin you know about that any emi books you can find but 
try to do it. Learn, you know, if your company has an EMI lab, radiated conducted emissions, go sit down and watch it. I mean, you might find it boring, you might find it horrible to watch, and it, you know, I find it the same way, but you've got to learn how to how to control it. You've got to learn what common mode, differential mode is, and so on. And uh, you can't ship a product without solving the EMI. Hank Otts, yes, Henry Otts, right? Yeah. I think was his uh, full name. So he's good. A lot of old timers doing the EMI because uh, universities don't really want to teach it because it's hard to teach something that doesn't have a good set of equations to optimize. We can't put AI on it. You know, it just the noise is what it is, and it surprises you. You you, you follow the theory, and it should have this cascade of you know, harmonics, and then suddenly, whoops, oh, that one there is about 30 dB higher than it should have been. And then you got to go track it down, which part of your circuit is getting resonant and kicking up that kind of noise. But uh, yeah, good topic. Um, I've been through it too many times. I, I don't want to do it again. If you want to call me and say, I've got an EMI problem, it's like, okay, maybe. <laughs> we'll probably put somebody else on it for you to help you. Um, you know, I'm pretty good at solving them. I just don't enjoy the process too much. It's not it's not a lot of fun because you know you go in there sometimes you just you just can't find the solution and so you're sitting right there with all the measurement equipment and then some kind of magic intuition comes in here let's try this and then boom all goes away and you fix it so reading employing Peltier's no, Peltier junction, if you put that in to get the heat down, and you can put as much energy into the Peltier junction as you're trying to take out of the other part. So I'm not sure that's going to help. Fusion power may come before artificial intelligence. Well, yeah, probably agree with that one. Okay, Professor Chuck claims that investing in high frequency megahertz range switches is useless. Um, well, there you go. I mean, tell tell Vicor that. Vicor has the biggest profit margin in this industry, by far. Everything is made here in the US, and they have put big profit margins on their product, and they're very successful. I mean, what are they, hundreds of millions, half a billion, something like that these days? But they're expanding their facilities. Their stock has gone through the roof. It's gone from 26 up to 90. So everything they do is a few megahertz. So Going to a megahertz is a waste of time. I don't know. Depends what you want to do. If you want to talk academics or you want to make some money, I think maybe there's a there's a there's a market there for that. One of the new products from Vicor. There's a little notebook here. 10 kilowatt converter. Okay. That's because they switch it to megahertz. Okay. Let me see you do that at 50 kilohertz. Not going to happen. So, yeah. Um, And of course, it's all power level related, you know, but megahertz is real. It, it's happening. People are making money at a megahertz. If you ever do design for, a, you know, 100 kilohertz flyback and then you try a 200 kilohertz and a 400 kilohertz flyback, it's like, oh, that's interesting <laughs> to see how you move with that design. And then lots of the converters are just pushing up into that low megahertz range now and, you know, being very, very successful with it. So. You know, this this whole thing about whether you can run this particular converter here at 50 kilohertz and make it just as tiny, I, that's an unknown to me. I'd like to know the answer to that. You know, Kenny Evan, I, I don't see it just based on the volt seconds on the transformer. But, you know, maybe there's something to that. But a big part of that is Dr. Chuk, I think, was the first one to say this, that the inductive energy storage is very, very inefficient volumetrically. But Vicor was the first one to get rid of the inductive energy storage. So their products are very mature. So every one of their converter has a very tiny inductor in it. So it's either discontinuous buck or it's an LLC type thing or whatever their converter is these days. It's a full bridge primary, full bridge secondary with just a small resonant inductor in there. But there is no magnetics energy storage in there. So, so, so that's new. But you know everything has to go hand in hand. Some frequencies don't move if you're doing utility power. You know, they're switching at two kilohertz. But, you know, the industry finds the sweet spot. And whoever's making money in the industry, look at where they're switching. So, you know, that's why it was kind of funny when Fin6 came out. 
you know, they said, well, we're going to switch at 30 megahertz and give you a little tiny converter. I mean, it's like, please, just, just look at what Vico's doing. That's probably where you're going to end up. And they didn't. They ended up 300 kilohertz instead of 30 megahertz. But, you know, the industry will tell you. It's already there. The money's been invested. You know where the marketplace is going to live on high frequencies. So hopefully that answers that one. Some of the universities where some good research is going on in power electronics. Um, University of Nottingham, come join our Facebook group and Al Watson is the contact there. He was the one that was designing that 200 uh, KV transformer. Virginia Tech, as always, unbelievable labs there. Every time I go there, they've invaded another building and they're doing more and more things in there. Just look for the labs, what's going on in the labs. That's the most important part of it. And those two universities work together now, of course. You know, they have a consortium where they actually work together. But they're, they're the two that come come to mind with me. So talk, go, to, go talk to those. Nanjing University in China. Which one? Nanjing. Nanjing in China? Yeah. Okay, so they've got good, have you been there? Big, big power electronic center. Okay. Huge. Yeah. So it's all about what's in the labs, what's going on in the labs. Don't just look at the papers, but I'm, I'm sure China is pouring lots and lots of money in there, uh, you know, to, to, to get power electronics. So that should really answer that question. Is this a good field to go into? And it's like, yeah, the investment right now is simply, simply enormous in here. So, so stay with it, stay with it. Might be losing a job right now, but it's going to come back. What else we got? Tem cells are good and cheap. I don't know what a Tem cell is, do you? Da, 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 radiation. EMI is the tricky part. EMI is tricky. EMI is no fun. Start with a quiet converter. So all these converters, the soft switching converters, they're going to win out not because they're dissipating less in the switches. That's much less important than the fact that their EMI signature is so much lower. Okay, and as voltages drop, you know, we've gone one volt now and they're down to about 0.3 volts, I think. EMI gets really, really important at that point. So you better be soft switching. So start with a quieter topology. And, you know, 50 years again, are we going to be doing hard switch converters anymore? Well, I hope not. I hope they're gone. But the soft switch converters right now, there's the price point aspect of that is if you want to soft switch and do this sophisticated topologies, multi-level topologies, everything switching resonantly, there's more money in the controller. And that used to be just not an option for low cost power. It takes more development time, but uh, you know, that will, that will all change, I think. So Tim we'll... cell is a PMI um, shielding box. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. Tim cells an EMI shielding box, apparently. <laughs> Thank you, John. That doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> I'd have to see what one is. But you know, you, you get yourself a lizard, figure out what a lizard is, you figure out how to measure EMI, and I have a little setup for that. I can't remember how to use it anymore, it's been so long. It's used for things like mobile, um, for cell phone testing and okay. lots of time okay. frequencies. Okay. Like yeah, I know LaCroix is doing a lot of good work in that, yeah. you know, especially with the automotive industry, but yeah, EMI is just, just huge there, just huge. Anyway, gosh, we've gone over an hour here, sorry about that. Didn't know if I was going to have anything to talk about today, but uh, I think we got most of the questions here. And thank you all for coming. And we'll probably do this in the morning next time because I think lots of people, even though it's happy hour, supposedly, cheers again. Um, I think people don't like to think about work when they go home, but hey, this was about careers, so maybe our boss doesn't well, want you thinking well, about well, careers. All right, Bob, raise his hand. Yeah. What's he? Okay, just type in your question, Bob, and then we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. We haven't figured out this unmuting thing. It doesn't seem to work. So there's something wrong with this platform here. You can't get people to talk, but we're going to try and work on that in the future. But if you have a question there, Bob, uh, throw that in the works. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Thank you, presentation. Good. Glad you like that. Um, as always, of course, help us out. We like doing this stuff, but we like to make some money too. Buy our frequency response analyzers. Come join our Facebook group. Come to our workshops. We're going to have some new announcements on workshops pretty soon. Our next workshop is in two weeks. I'll leave that as a mystery to you. 
Uh, you got free books, you got the Power Supply Design Center articles, come read all these things here. Uh, read a lot, learn a lot, try to buy our products and help us out. And then of course we've got the Ridley box as always, so that the lad is there. If you're stuck at home now, this is a really nice tool because you've got a four channel scope and a frequency response analyzer and our design software, injection isolator all in one. And of course you get us to support you. So a lot of our mentoring is actually through the Ridley box. When people buy these, we actually log on to their computer, we help them with the measurement, and then we kind of get involved in their design as well. That's probably gonna slow down as we sell more and more of these because we're gonna get stretched a bit thin, but that's working out quite quite nicely right now. So I wanted to sign up, but COVID happened. Yes, well, we have a plan for that too. So stay in touch with us. Uh, Ashuk. Aniru uh, let me know, let us know where you're from and then we'll get in touch with you about that as well. And um, we'll talk to you all again soon in uh, three, four weeks, we'll have another, another one of these and we will tell you how our workshop went and how we managed to keep everybody safe and didn't give them COVID and uh, everybody had a great time. So that's a deep dark secret right now that only a handful of people know about, but we'll, we'll come up with that soon. And um, everybody out there, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.